So now we know how to quantify, how to measure dependence. And let me point out uh, a couple of uh, additional considerations on uh, the correlation coefficient. We already learned that it varies between minus 1 and 1. We learned that 0 means lack of uh, correlation. Now let's, uh, let's understand what it means if the correlation coefficient is uh, equal to 1 in absolute value. So we learned that 0 is no dependence. We learned that positive values means that there is positive dependence, where with positive I mean that high flows are succeeded by high flows. We learned that negative values means, mean negative dependence, high flow, low flows. Now, what does it mean if uh, the correlation coefficient is equal to 1? Basically, if uh, the correlation coefficient is equal to 1, it means that the relationship between the two variables is perfectly described by a linear dependence, by a linear function. So if we plot, for instance, Q QT plus 1 versus QT, and in this case I'm referring to L equal to 1, lag equal to 1, if we get the points that are perfectly displaced along a straight line, then rho 1 is equal to 1. If uh, in this case is equal to 1, and in this case uh, it's, if, if it's, uh, it's equal to 1 if high values correspond to high values. So if the slope of the straight line is, you know, is, is uh, in, in this case increasing. So again, if uh, the relationship between the two variables is perfectly deterministically described by a linear function, then the correlation coefficient is 1. And then we say that the correlation coefficient, and let me say that this is the Pearson correlation coefficient, there are details here, it's called Pearson correlation coefficient. Let's say that it's a measure of linear dependence, and this explains why my premise when introducing the correlation was that correlation is a measure of linear dependence. If the dependence is non-linear, the correlation coefficient is not equal to 1, even if the relationship is perfectly deterministic. So if above here you have something like that, that describes uh, the relationship between the two variables, and let's assume that this is an analytical function, so you have a deterministic relationship between the two variables, but if this deterministic relationship is not described by a straight line, so it's not described by a linear relationship, then in this case, rho 1 is different from 1. And uh, this is something that you have to take into account because, you know, the fact that you have rho equal to 0 0.5 it doesn't mean that the relationship is not deterministic. It means that the relationship between the two variables is not linear. And then keep in mind that this brings us to another conclusion. The conclusion is that if you have correlation, you have dependence. But you may have dependence without correlation. Again, the presence of correlation implies dependence. But the opposite is not true. You may have dependence without correlation. It's extremely unlikely. But you may have it. So what is the 
what is measured by correlation? Correlation measures the fact that uh, if you have a value above the mean for one variable, then you have a corresponding, for the other value, variable, a corresponding value that is still above the mean, or regularly below the mean. And in this case, you get a correlation that is significantly different from zero. But this relationship must be regular. If you have, a, you know, something that alternates above the mean, below the mean, and then above the mean, above the mean, if they are alternate, you may get zero correlation, even if you have dependence. Like this function, you see, it's it's first decreasing, which means negative correlation, and then increasing, which means positive correlation. It's non-linear, so this may happen. And therefore, this function describes a dependency, a memory that is first negative and then positive. And when you compute correlation, these two effects cancel each other. So you may have this deterministic relationship, but still, still, the correlation is zero. So what I want to say is that if you see correlation, then there is dependence. If you don't see correlation, there still might be dependence, which is nonlinear. And now you can understand why we say linear stochastic processes, because uh, these processes, uh, these uh, transformations, subsequent transformations that I am introducing, aim at reproducing <coughs> linear dependence. If there is no linear dependence, this framework may not work, may be misleading. But in, a, in hydrology, in a, it happens uh, quite frequently that most of the processes can be well approximated by linearity, most of them especially if the time scale of observation is something that is not very short. And, and therefore, we say that hydrology is mostly quasi-linear. And therefore, you don't have to really care about the possible presence of hidden nonlinearity. So in hydrology, correlation is a good measure for dependence. This is the technical conclusion. OK, so basically, if we see correlation, like in this case, of course, we have to remove it. Because uh, our aim is to get to independent variables. So how can we remove this correlation? So a uh, very straightforward idea is try to remove it through a linear transformation. And this is what the last transformation that I'm proposing to you to apply to this series. So let's take, the question is, does it exist a linear transformation, linear means very simple, a regression that allows me to remove this dependence? And uh, there are several different linear transformations that can be introduced. Let me introduce the most, uh, the, the simpler one, which is regression. And, uh, It's extremely simple. The formula is here, is here already, but let me write it on the blackboard. And uh, this is called autoregressive transformation. And uh, it's called auto. The prefix auto means that even if we are dealing with different variables, they are actually, they all, all of them refer to river flow, to only one process. And the, the diversity of the variables is just given by the time step, which is different. And therefore, we say autoregressive because it's not one variable, different process that is regressed against another one. It's the same process that is regressed over himself. 
and therefore we say auto. And uh, this is a regression of river flows depending on previous river flows, so it's auto. And uh, so it's very simple. Let's uh, transform the variable by computing a variable that we call epsilon at time t, which is given by the river flow observed at the same time t. And I'm dropping the d because it's decisionalized the d, but let's drop it minus a coefficient phi1 which multiplies qt minus 1. And I'm stopping here, but I could I could add other regressive terms. So you see here it's the same relationship, but there is also a minus phi2 times q t minus 2 plus Plus, uh, minus minus, uh, this is, uh, sorry, here there is a mistake, I need to correct it. This is phi k, which multiplies q t minus k. And if we want to write it in compact form, it can be written like epsilon t is equal q t minus the summation for i equal 1 to k of phi i, which multiplies q t minus i. And then you see that there are k regressive terms. Basically, what I'm trying to do is very simple. I'm trying to express the river flow at time t as a linear function of the previous river flows. And therefore, I'm trying to reproduce the dependence through a linear function. And if you include only one autoregressive term, it's written in the very simple form that Simon t is equal to qt minus phi1 qt minus 1. It's a very simple regressive transformation. And look, it's extremely important to note that I am expressing Q, as I said before, as a linear function of previous Qs. At this stage, I have an important remark to make which is related to my initial assumption of Gaussian distribution. And it's uh, an extremely important and also, I think, interesting remark. And uh, it's related to the fact that, as I said, I just said that I'm trying to express QT as a linear function of previous Qs. And I'm, what is Q? It's river flow. And uh, look. I want the distribution of Q at different times be the same, identical, should be the same. But then, given that I am expressing the river flow at time t as a function of the previous ones, the previous ones are Gaussian, the result is still Gaussian. I want that the distribution probability distribution is preserved through this transformation. So it's a linear transformation that should preserve the distribution. This is not an obvious remark, because usually when you get a data from a probability distribution and you transform them, you change the distribution. It's not absolutely true. It's never true that you preserve the distribution. There are only a few exceptions. So usually, you get a bunch of data, you transform them, you change the probability distribution. At least you change the parameters, but usually you change also the shape of the distribution. There is only one distribution that is preserved through a linear transformation, and this distribution is the Gaussian distribution. This is an important property of the Gaussian distribution. If you apply a linear transform, you preserve the distribution, it's still Gaussian. But it's the only one. 
And therefore, you easily understand that I need the data to be Gaussian. If I want to express the data as a linear function of previous ones, I need the distribution to be Gaussian. This is why I assume that the beginning, I want the distribution to be Gaussian, because otherwise I can't apply a linear mode. And this is interesting, I think, because first of all, you learn that there is one probability distribution that is preserved, and it's only one. And second, you learn, you know, we are talking about random events here, and you learn that there is, in randomness, there is an order, which is interesting. I mean, it's interesting. Of course, this order is related also to the physical properties of the process, but it's, it's interesting to see that even when we don't fully understand the physical process, there is, in randomness, something that comes out which is coherent. OK. And uh, please note that, according to this representation, still this Q should be 0 mean. Otherwise, I should change the notation here. So there is always an underlying assumption of 0 mean which according to our procedure is met because we decisionalized and if you decisionalize you bring everything to zero mean. Okay, now let's try to make this linear transform over our polymer time series and let's take the autoregressive one Now, let me think about uh, an easy way to make it. But I think that the fourth cycle probably is. I think there is an easier way, but I think the fourth cycle is, is uh, the most uh, convenient one. So uh, I don't remember the length of PO3, POD3. OK, so basically, I need a fourth cycle. So let me write that Simon <coughs> is equal to repetition, sorry, repetition 0, 31, 390. Okay, and then let me write 4 e in 2, 31, 390. And then I can write, oops, oh yeah, sorry. And then I can write epsilon i is equal to b o d 3 <coughs> i uh, i minus B1 POD3 sorry, pi should be between square parentheses POD3 pi minus 1 now I get a mistake when I type uh, when I give enter, I get a mistake because uh, uh, there is uh, phi i which was not defined first of all this should be like that this but it's not defined. So I need to define it. And let me put a guess value for phi 1, because phi 1 should be estimated through linear regression. And let me put a guess value. Okay, just what I want to make now is just to provide an example of linear transformation and to show you that the memory, the dependence goes down is, is uh, decreased. So let me say phi1, I guess value is 0.9. Because I saw that there is a very strong dependence. So I think that we should use a high value for phi1. And I will tell you later how we can estimate it. So again, the fourth cycle and this, sorry. I did a mistake. 
and here it is epsilon i between square parentheses. Let me check everything else. I think it's correct now. Perfect. So it's estimated. And now let me plot the, the series, the, the resulting series, plot epsilon type equal line. So let's look at the plot. You see that something is really changed, indeed. And uh, you don't see the fluctuation that you saw before. And uh, for instance, if I plot instead of epsilon p of d3, you see that there are fluctuations in there. And the fluctuations are given by the memory. If I now plot epsilon, first of all, you see the variability is between minus 4 and plus 4. If I plot epsilon, the fluctuations are much reduced, and the variability is, uh, the series is much more compact. There are some outliers still between minus 4 and 4, but it's more compact. OK, now let's see the correlation. And remember that the correlation of uh, of P of D3 is this one. Now, let's see the correlation of epsilon. And remember that I tried with just a guess value of phi1. The correlation is here. You see that it's much decreased. Even if, it, even if I apply just a prior value of phi1. So the idea is good. Still, it's not. There is still some memory. You see the bands. And there is still some memory. So this experiment tells me, first, that my linear transformation was not fully effective in removing the memory. So I have to improve it. Second, it tells me that, and you see here, there is still a very uh, significant correlation. Forget about uh, the first term. And I'll explain to you why it's 1. But you see that even for the second term, it's still significant. Now, let me say, so the idea is good, I mean. I still have to solve the problem of estimating this V1, but the idea is good. And let me now say, uh, speak and discuss about the first term. The first term is 1 and is computed for lag 0. Indeed, if you take your formula for the correlation, the formula that I, I gave to you, and you try to put L equal to 0, what you get is uh, is a result that must necessarily be 1 by definition. Why is that? Let's see. Remember that we are talking about a 0 mean variable. So rho 0 is equal to the summation from t equal 1 to n minus l, but n minus l reduces to n, and uh, divided by, sorry, I, I forgot here to divide 1 divided by 1 n minus l. Again, l is 0. So it's divided by n. And at the numerator, you have uh, q t times q t. And at the denominator, you have, because this would be t plus l, but l is 0. At the denominator, you have sigma square u. OK. Now, if you remember how the variance is computed for a zero mean variable, it's just the product of, it's just the square of uh, the observations. If the mean is zero, the variance <laughs> is computed by taking the square of the observations. If you go back to, my esti to the estimate that I gave to you, so it's clear that this becomes equal to sigma square q divided by sigma square q, which is 1. With only a small difference that we don't discuss here. It's related to the fact that when I computed the variance, I put not 1 divided by n, but 1 divided n minus 1. But this is a very small difference. And so basically, you see why for lag 0, the autocorrelation function assumes the unit value. Okay. 
So these are the linear transformations that I introduced. And uh, if this linear transformation were effective, I should get, remember, I should get i, i, d random variables, independent and identically distributed Gaussian. So I can check if the result is good. And how can I check? This is one first check. The correlation function, autocorrelation function of epsilon should lie within these bands. This is one first check. Second check. So this is related to memory. Gaussianity, what is the probability distribution of epsilon? Epsilon should be, again, Gaussian. Because it's a linear transformation of Gaussian variables. So I can plot the density of epsilon. Plot density epsilon type equal line. Sorry, one. And you see, it's uh, not really Gaussian because uh, just because there are a few outliers uh, that make the tails very long, it's symmetric, but there are these outliers that are too. Uh, the Gaussian distribution should be. Uh, they cannot. Uh, well, this is not really. This is not a variance equal to one. So there should be. Let's say there are a few observations that make it non-Gaussian. A few of them. And uh, so basically, if you look at the graph, of course, you would say this is not Gaussian. But I tell you, if you make a check, the problem is just given by a few of them. And these are the observations that you can see here. If you plot the time series, here it is. You see that there are only a few ones. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, maybe 10 of them. If you remove these 10 observations, it uh, becomes fairly close to Gaussian. And remember that I used a guess value for V1. So it's not bad. I mean, this is a second check that you can make. And uh, a third check could be on the marginal distribution, but usually we don't do that. So what is uh, still to be discussed? Uh, we need to discuss how to estimate phi1 and uh, or in, in general the autoregressive coefficients and uh, we need to discuss uh, how to generate the data because at this stage uh, we discussed about setting up a model how to check if the model is satisfactory but then we have to generate the data and at, at uh, the final stage we need to make a further check that the generated data are reliable and uh, you know, credible. Now, uh, generation will be discussed tomorrow. Tomorrow we'll discuss about generation of the data because we can do that by, it's very simple, by the way. What you have to do is just to generate data numbers from I, uh, an IID distribution because we ended up with IID data. So you can generate random numbers from a distribution, a probability distribution, which is the same for all the time steps. And then you have to apply back the anti-transformations that we did. So the inverse of any transformation in the same order. So first, linear, the linear combination, then the seasonal component, then the inverse of the logarithmic, which is the exponential transformation. So it's very simple. We can do that at the PC because it's, uh, I think it's more useful if you do it in practice. So we can do it tomorrow. I'm not sure if we'll be able to finish the exercise tomorrow, but still, we can discuss this tomorrow. Now let me anticipate. Uh, let's assume that we want to estimate an autoregressive linear relationship of order one, only one autoregressive term, we say autoregressive model of order one. 
So we have one parameter to estimate, phi1. How can we estimate it? Let me anticipate this. I'm not going to uh, provide any proof. I just want to quickly give you the solution. And uh, it can be proved uh, under certain assumptions that are generally met, because they are more or less the same assumptions that we are using here. So zero mean random variable and uh, zero mean process and uh, Gaussianity. It can be proved that for process or model of order one, it can be proved that phi one is equal to rho one. Very simple. What? Sorry, of Q. Another way that another method that you can easily use uh, to compute this uh, coefficient is uh, through linear regression. And uh, it can be easily done in R because you know how to estimate, how to optimize a model. <coughs> you know how to calibrate a model. So our model basically is uh, epsilon t is equal to qt minus phi1, q, p minus 1. This is our model, correct? And uh, our parameter is phi1 parameter. Now, what is epsilon? Epsilon, you can provide an interpretation of epsilon as uh, the error of uh, the linear model. You see that Basically, you have the difference between QT and the linear function of the previous value. If this linear relationship works perfectly, what is the result of QT minus the linear function of the previous value? It will be zero, because it means that the linear relationship, which is this one, provides a perfect representation of QT. So if this linear relationship was perfect, epsilon would be zero. So the best model is the model that minimizes epsilon. So if you look for the minimum of the sum of epsilon squared, If you look for the least squares by varying phi1, so you vary phi1 and you find the value of phi1 that brings you to get the minimum, it's just an arrow, of the sum of squares. And this can be easily done in R because, uh, you know, I have already the epsilon series, which is there. This is the epsilon series. And I can compute the sum of uh, epsilon squared. 
square. And I look for the phi value that brings this sum to the minimum. Let me make just a few attempts. Let me go back to the instruction for computing epsilon. Or let me first uh, try with a different phi1. Phi1 equal 0.5. This is another trial value, OK? OK, now let me compute epsilon. And remember that the previous sum of square is here. This is the previous sum of square. Let me recompute epsilon. I get the fourth cycle. And then I get the computation here. Now let's look again at the sum of epsilon. You see that it's increased. So it means that 0.9 was a better guess than 0.5. OK, now let's try with uh, 0.95. It's better than 2. Point, uh, it's better than 2500. This is the best one so far. So let me try again with uh, 0.98. Uh, this is a bit worse. So the optimum value is between 0.95 and 0.98. And then I look in between. This is another easy way to estimate phi1. This is just a linear regression, and you can use the E of t to compute it. But another alternative is probably simpler. And what is, uh, according to, what is uh, the best value according to this method? Let me compute, let me get back the autocorrelation function of uh, the series. Here. You see, this is. The